Hindsight says anybody in an armchair could have generalized the same all or none principle to the inheritance of each and every characteristic. Fascinatingly, Darwin himself was glimmeringly close to this, but he stopped just short of making the full connection. In 1866, he wrote in a letter to Alfred Wallace, My dear Wallace, I do not think you understand what I mean by the non blending of certain varieties. It does not refer to fertility. An instance will explain. I crossed the painted lady and purple sweet peas, which are very differently coloured varieties, and got, even out of the same pod, both varieties perfect, but none intermediate. Something of this kind, I should think, must occur at first with your butterflies. Though these cases are in appearance so wonderful, I do not know that they are really more so than every female in the world producing distinct male and female offspring. Darwin came that close to discovering Mendel's law of the non blending of what we would now call genes. But he didn't see its generality, and in particular, he failed to see it as the answer to the riddle of why variation didn't automatically disappear from populations. That was left to 20th century scientists, building on Mendel's, before his time, discovery. So now the concept of the gene pool starts to make sense. A sexually reproducing population, such as, say, all the rats on Ascension Island, remotely isolated in the South Atlantic, is continually shuffling all the genes on the island. There is no intrinsic tendency for each generation to become less variable than the previous generation, no tendency towards ever more boringly grey, middling intermediates. The genes remain intact, shuffled about from individual body to individual body as the generations go by, but not blending with one another, never contaminating each other. At any one time, the genes are all sitting in the bodies of individual rats, or they are moving into new rat bodies via sperms. But if we take a long view across many generations, we see all the rat genes on the island being mixed up as though they were cards in a single well-shuffled pack, one single pool of genes. I'm guessing that the rat gene pool on a small and isolated island such as Ascension is a self-contained and rather well-stirred pool. But the gene pool of rats on a large landmass such as Eurasia would be much more complicated. A rat living in Madrid would derive most of its genes from ancestors living in the western end of the Eurasian continent, rather than, say, Mongolia or Siberia, not because of specific barriers to gene flow, though those exist too, but because of the sheer distances involved. It takes time for sexual shuffling to work a gene from one side of a continent to the other. Moreover, partial barriers such as mountain ranges, large rivers or deserts would further get in the way of homogeneous shuffling, thereby structuring and complicating the gene pool. Just to round off the thought about gene pools, each individual animal that we see in a population is a sampling of the gene pool of its time, or rather its parents' time. There is no intrinsic tendency in gene pools for particular genes to increase or decrease in frequency. But when there is a systematic increase or decrease in the frequency with which we see a particular gene in a gene pool, that is precisely and exactly what is meant by evolution. The question therefore becomes, why should there be a systematic increase or decrease in a gene's frequency? That, of course, is where things start to get interesting, and we shall come to it in due course. Something funny happens to the gene pools of domestic dogs. Breeders of pedigree Pekingeses or Dalmatians go to elaborate lengths to stop genes crossing from one gene pool to another. Stud books are kept, going back many generations, and miscegenation is the worst thing that can happen in the book of a pedigree breeder. It is as though each breed of dog were incarcerated on its own little Ascension Island, kept apart from every other breed. But the barrier to interbreeding is not blue water, but human rules. Now let's return to the remark that opened my discussion of gene pools. I said that if human breeders are to be seen as sculptors, 
what they are carving with their chisels is not dog flesh, but gene pools. It appears to be dog flesh because the breeder might announce an intention to, say, shorten the snouts of future generations of boxers. And the end product of such an intention would indeed be a shorter snout, as though a chisel had been taken to the ancestor's face. But, as we have seen, a typical boxer in any one generation is a sampling of the contemporary gene pool. It is the gene pool that has been carved and whittled over the years. Genes for long snouts have been chiselled out of the gene pool and replaced by genes for short snouts. Every breed of dog, from Dachshund to Dalmatian, from Boxer to Borzoi, from Poodle to Pekingese, from Great Dane to Chihuahua, has been carved, chiselled, kneaded, moulded, not literally as flesh and bone, but in its gene pool. Sometimes new breeds of dog get their start with the adoption of a single major mutation. Mutations are the random changes in genes that constitute the raw material for evolution by non-random selection. In nature, large mutations seldom survive, but geneticists like them in the laboratory because they're easy to study. Breeds of dog with very short legs, like basset hounds and dachshunds, acquired them in a single step with the genetic mutation called achondroplasia, a classic example of a large mutation that would be unlikely to survive in nature. Other genetic roots produce miniature breeds that retain the proportions of the original. Dog breeders can achieve changes in size and shape by selecting combinations of a few major mutations, such as achondroplasia, and lots of minor genes. Nor do they need to understand the genetics in order to achieve change effectively. Without any understanding at all, just by choosing who mates with whom, you can breed for all kinds of desired characteristics. This is what dog breeders, and animal and plant breeders generally, achieved for centuries before anybody understood anything about genetics. And there's a lesson in that about natural selection, for nature, of course, has no understanding or awareness of anything at all. What lessons do we learn from the domestication of the dog? First, the great variety among breeds of dogs demonstrates how easy it is for the non-random selection of genes, the carving and whittling of gene pools, to produce truly dramatic changes in anatomy and behaviour, and so fast. Surprisingly, few genes may be involved, yet the changes are so large, the differences between breeds so dramatic, that you might expect their evolution to take millions of years instead of just a matter of centuries. If so much evolutionary change can be achieved in just a few centuries or even decades, just think what might be achieved in ten or a hundred million years. The idea of carving or sculpting calls to mind the over-muscled physiques of human bodybuilders and non-human equivalents such as the Belgian blue breed of cattle. This walking beef factory has been contrived via a particular genetic alteration called double muscling. There is a substance called myostatin which limits muscle growth. If the gene that makes myostatin is disabled, muscles grow larger than usual. It's quite often the case that a given gene can mutate in more than one way to produce the same outcome, and indeed there are various ways in which the myostatin-producing gene can be disabled with the same effect. Human bodybuilders achieve a similar physique by an extreme regime of exercise and often by the use of anabolic steroids, both environmental manipulations that mimic the genes of the Belgian blue. The end result is the same, and that is a lesson in itself. Genetic and environmental changes can produce identical outcomes. If you wanted to rear a human child to win a bodybuilding contest and you had a few centuries to spare, you could start by genetic manipulation, engineering exactly the same freak gene as characterises Belgian blue cattle. Indeed, there are some humans known to have deletions of the myostatin gene and they tend to be abnormally well-muscled. If you started with a mutant child and made it pump iron as well, Presumably the cattle could not be cajoled into this. You could probably end up with something more grotesque than Mr. Universe. 
Political opposition to eugenic breeding of humans sometimes spills over into the almost certainly false assertion that it is impossible. Not only is it immoral, you may hear it said, it wouldn't work. Unfortunately, to say that something is morally wrong or politically undesirable is not to say that it wouldn't work.